a lot's changed in 50 years. You think about where Wilson Audio came from. You had a husband and a wife that made the decision, the entrepreneurial leap of faith. Let's do something that will completely scare us and potentially change the course of our lives. Welcome to the Stereo Net channel. Today we have a very distinguished guest, Daryl Wilson, the CEO of Wilson Audio. Firstly, welcome Daryl. It's a pleasure to have you here in Australia. You've come a long way from the US. Congratulations on getting to almost the 50th year of Wilson Audio. That's a milestone for an audio company and most companies in the world. Is there a buzz inside Wilson Audio at present as you near this moment? And are you planning to celebrate in a special way? Thank you for having me, and, uh, I, and I apologize if uh, I'm a little jet-lagged, and so I'll do my best during this interview. There is a buzz, and we have several um, fun things in the works right now. Some uh, projects that we can't quite discuss right now, but you'll be hearing about before the end of the year. Um, it's A lot's changed in 50 years. You think about where Wilson Audio came from. You had a husband and a wife that made the decision, the entrepreneurial leap of faith, Let's do something that will completely scare us and potentially change the course of our lives. And my mom put it well when uh, they were talking about, well, should, should we build these loudspeakers, continue recording, doing these types of things and, and be our own business, be our own bosses? Or should we continue to work? You know, pharmaceutical is, is what my dad was in before. And uh, she made the comment, you know, if we look, when we're 50 years old, if we look back, do we want to think, what if? And so they made the, the leap, and, and I'm very grateful that they did. And I think there are a lot of music lovers out there that uh, also feel the same. So Wilson's Audio's first product was a turntable. You've mentioned audiophile recordings, and then you went into loudspeakers. Are there any other audio products that Wilson Audio have been interested in? Yeah, we've done, we've done several things. And there have been a lot of products that we've started developing that never made it to market because they didn't reach our standard of excellence. Right now we have uh, two way small compact uh, shelf loudspeakers. We have uh, a variety of floor standing full range speakers. We have powered and passive subwoofers. We have center channels. We have uh, surround products and products that can be used for Atmos systems. I think we have a really wide variety of, of products. One of the things that companies do that tend to to diminish the brand with time is think that they should be the solution for all applications. And you start losing what your culture is at that point. Mm. Um, so we, we tend to be very hyper-focused on what can we do in the loudspeaker realm and do it to the level of excellence that we demand from ourselves and our customers demand from, uh, from our company. Every year during our annual meeting, we of course, we throw out all kinds of ideas. Should we do this? And, and, and dealers and distributors, they're asking us for this kind of product. Do we want to spend our resources, our time and energy, which is very limited, on developing or expanding into this other area? So where we are right now is a net result of you know, 50 year, almost 50 years of talking about that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, so we're, we're very happy with the, the product lineup that we have right now. And um, like I mentioned before, 50th anniversary, there's some fun stuff coming. Good. Uh, how do you characterize the improvements of Wilson Audio products in the last almost 50 years? So if you start with the Wham and you move forward to, say, the Alex or the XVX, you've got 40 plus years of drive unit and materials that have improved. How does that translate into sound quality improvements? Our North Star for how we develop is live unamplified music. So having had the privilege of listening to music in the Concertgebouw and um, the Musikverein, uh, local halls in, in Utah, Abravanel Hall, Severance Hall in Cleveland, just hearing music in, in, in spaces and having access to those spaces during rehearsals where we could walk around the room and listen to music because when you're in a hall, no two seats sound the same, and people will argue, well, what's better, going and hearing a live you know, performance or listening to my system at home? And frankly, I, I think that it's impossible to hear um, in the hall during a performance what the microphone's picking up, because the microphone is physically in a place that no one can physically sit, and so you'll never get that sound, right? It's just a different type of sound. 
but using that as a reference. My father and Wilson Audio in general over the decades, it's always been that is the North Star and then what technologies are available to us now to get as close to that as possible. And so you look at a loudspeaker, the anatomy of a loudspeaker, you've got the drivers and you can refine and fine tune those and driver technology has gotten uh, much better over the years. The enclosures, how, how dead and damped can you make the enclosure sound? So the only thing making noise is the drive, the drive units. And that's come a long way with computer programming and uh, CNC machining and precision there and material research the types of materials that we use. Back with the original WAM, uh, we used um, uh, aluminum baffle, we, we used a variety of woods, including birch and, and plywood, you know, in the early versions. And then of course we developed uh, X material, S material, now V material. And those all have very specific characteristics, um, sonic characteristics. So you have the materials with the enclosures. And then you look at the anatomy of a crossover and the components in the crossovers. Back when my father started making loudspeakers uh, on, in a commercial sense, we didn't have a capacitor manufacturing department inside of the building. And so now we're able to experiment, wind, and uh, create capacitors in, in a very unique way that is exclusive to Wilson Audio. So um, pulling back at um, and looking at each of the elements of a, of a loudspeaker, you can point at the footers, the enclosure, the crossover, the drive units, our ability to measure time alignment and the accuracy within a system, cable technology, all those things over the last 50 years, each one of those pieces has gotten better and better. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to make sure that we're refining the system, uh, that we're finding the best solutions or creating the best solutions in that specific area. So Wilson Audio, it's become an uh, aspirational brand and even considered the pinnacle by many users or want to be users. From its inception in its early days, was this by design or has it been sort of an organic growth of that's where you've come to that point now of being like the pinnacle for many people? Yeah, I have never heard my dad say, I'm going to create this thing because I want to be the best in the world in this, in an egotistical sense. Everything that we do as a company, we focus on attaining excellence. Perfection is, is truly impossible, right? But excellence is within our grasp, is a quote that he used to say and, and I love. Uh, perfection is kind of the vision, but our everyday actions is the path. And that's, that's the pursuit of excellence and excellence in all things. Building the best and doing the best you can, and especially when you have a team of craftspeople at Wilson Audio, that are competitive by nature and artists in their hearts. It's amazing the kinds of things that we're able to do. If I were to be able to you know, put on paper, hey, I want this product to look this way, I want it to, to fit in this, uh, these materials, but we couldn't manufacture it, it's at that point, it's just, it's a thought, it's a dream, right? So it's a combination of the quality of, of the team that matches the vision of the designer to be able to create the product that can be consistent and manufactured time and time again um, and, and be repeatably excellent. Mm. Um, so going back to your original question, as far as you know, being the best, I think when you put that formula together, that it, the net result is something that is aspirational that like a, like a sword handcrafted in Japan that takes a long time to make and is state of the art for what it is, a person could argue, well, the material cost is this, but you're not taking into account the life that that person put into honing their craft. And Wilson Audio is, is the average tenor, tenure at Wilson Audio is 12 years with 60 employees. Um, so the, the knowledge, the depth of knowledge within our our craftspeople is very deep. Mm. Um, and that brings a lot of value in it. And it, and it allows us as a company to, to envision products that are just beyond what we can do now and we figure out how to do it. And that, that there's a lot of fun and, and it's challenging, but a lot of fun in that. I've read that Wilson Audio Lad Speakers have been chosen by famous people such as Wesley Snipes, Lenny Kravitz, uh, and even Steve Jobs, who was a, an avid audiophile. Are there any other interesting or celebrity owners that you might want to mention? 
uh, there's a funny story with this Steve Jobs. My dad was at his house, and uh, they were uh, uh, setting up and listening to the X1s, and uh, Steve Jobs' son, his snake got out of his cage. And they spent a lot of time on their hands and knees looking for this snake around the house. And so um, through the years, I've always appreciated um, hearing that side of it, that it's not always about, you know, designing the best loudspeaker and that there's such a human side of this. And I think all of us as people who love music and are audiophiles or just people that, you know, at the end of a stressful day, want to sit down and, and not worry about that stuff and just leave that right at the door as you go into your listening room and play your favorite music, right? At that point, it's not about the, the you know, what's the cap capacitor made out of. It's about this is my release. This is, this is my escapism. Staying connected with the, the human element of what we do is very important. There are other people that, that people know, the, Lenny Kravitz, uh, Paul McCartney, Puff Daddy has them. Uh, the people that I found that I engage with at shows or I'm introduced to that really dive in deep, they're the producers, they're, they're the people behind the scenes that have to listen and do the quality control on what the mix sounds like. Yeah. And it's their job and, and it's what makes or break the album, right? Does it sound good? Does it, is, it, is it representing what the recording artist really wants the listener to hear? Um, and so those people, the, I have very interesting conversations with those kind of people. Yeah. Wilson Audio has never been afraid to innovate. You've mentioned here today around a bunch of craftsmen that exist at Wilson Audio. So if we look at the first Wham and then the Watt product, yeah. totally different loudspeakers, shape, size, yeah. and I guess even their use. Yeah. But both stunned the audio world. What drives this process of innovation? And is it easier with your craftsmen within Wilson Audio? I have to go back to the North Star. The North Star is live on amplified music. And then thinking, what do I want in my system? We wouldn't be developing a center channel if we didn't want to put that center channel in our system at home. And we wouldn't develop it in a way that we wouldn't be proud of. Going back to the original Wham, the ultimate reference tool from when my dad was a, a, a young boy inspired by an event that fooled him to think that carolers were outside of his bedroom. And it was just a clip horn that was set up down the street, right? So, so he was fascinated with that. That speaker made me think that people were there. Mm. Speakers can transport my mind to believing something there that's not. And so he studied and learned and, and you know, over the next uh, uh, decade and a half, he and his friends would build makeshift, you know, Heath kits and, and loudspeakers and, and whatnot. And then he became a recording engineer and then needed a tool to be able to hear what he was hearing in the hall. And so the original Wham, you know, was made. And, um, and then he had a situation where he went to a recording session, spent a lot of time and effort and, and money to be able to record and brought home the master tapes, played it on the whams, and it didn't sound like anything like he experienced. Mm -hmm. And that's because he was using the studio monitors that were provided there, and he was making EQing decisions based off of what he was hearing out of those. And so he realized, I need to build a compact system that I can carry with me with all my gear that speaks the same language as the wham. And so he put the same time and effort into developing the watt as he did the wham. The purpose wasn't to really sell it. The purpose was it to be a tool for him. And my mom was like, people are going to want to buy it. We should show it. And so he showed it. And after that CES, they had like five new dealers that wanted to come on board and they were, you know, taking orders for him. And my dad was really, my mom wasn't surprised because she sees the genius and she sees, you know, what he's capable of doing, but he's just doing what he loves. Yeah. Um, so deciding what the next product is, is, um, what do we want in our house? And um, for instance, the Alexia, Alexia V is the current model of Alexia and Alexia series two, there was five years, five years of development. You think about the XVX and you think about other products, the Alex V and, and other things that we were developing. And then you look at the Alexia series two after five years and it's like, look at all the things that we did at a grassroots level that we could implement in here and have over 30 changes 
and they're significant. You know, 1% improvement in sound here, 3% here, half a percent here, but you add all that together and it's a substantial, you know, improvement in product. And so that's the way we develop when, you know, when I, I've got Alexi V's in my home, right? And so when I think about, I, I want this system in my house, I want to make it the best I can. Yeah. And so I make it for me, our R&D team, we make it for us and our craftspeople, we engage them. We I, Every time we have uh, uh, our second version of prototype, I bring down uh, the craftspeople and it's like, how would you make this better? What do you think about this? And, and we get, you know, great uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and products evolve in a very good, um, organic way with that process. So you've mentioned there that bringing in new products, what does Wilson Audio face in trying to create, once you've introduced a new product into the market, how do you see where it's going to fit? As you say, you design it for yourself. How does the public then foresee that, that that's a need or a want? There are certain questions that um, I got my degree in international business with an emphasis in business and living and working side by side with my dad um, and with the R&D team uh, my, my entire adult life and a lot of my childhood I was, I was building things side by side with my dad and just helping him out because he never just gave me money, he gave me opportunity to earn money. And so I'd work for him and then I'd go buy my gummy bears and play video games, buy pizza like kids do, right? Building and, and developing products, it, it's a complicated, I, I don't know how to answer that because it's not the, the standard business model at Wilson Audio. It's not, hey, you know, here are, the, here are the analytics for the market. This is what the market's buying and, and the market's saying um, that they want a small, compact uh, floor standing speaker that is uh, wireless and powered. And it says this, you know, the, this is the percentage of the market. We could grab that percentage of the market. It, that's just not how we operate. It's how do we, in, in whatever package it is, for this package right here, for the Lexi V that's, that's sitting behind us, for this package, how can we get the most performance and get us as close to that live unamplified music or what's on that recording. How do we get as close to that as possible? That's the kind of mind frame that we're in when we develop and we uh, set course on saying, hey, here's a new product or here's how we better a current product. So it moves slightly technical. Resonance control is a vital part for loudspeakers and the audio system and audio chain. How important is resonance control compared to other aspects in loudspeaker design? And what other facets of loudspeaker design do you portray as being important? Yes, um, that's, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure our cabinets um, are inherently damped. And um, we develop our products, especially with the V material, the V series products, where um, we've developed a product that is incredibly dead and damped. And so it creates isolation between cabinets. It creates isolation and vibration sinks. That is very important to us. An enclosure where you start turning up the volume and of course SPLs go up and, and the woofers especially, I mean, they're really moving and there's a lot of pressure there. If the enclosure is, is singing along with the music, that's technically distortion. So anything that's not coming from the drivers is distortion. So we want to minimize that. However, if you have um, in the hierarchy of what's important for us, if you have um, an enclosure that is mostly damped, it, it, you know, it, it creates a little bit of noise, but the timing is absolutely accurate on it. So the signal that is being fed from the crossover to the mid range and the signal that's going to the woofer woofers, in this case, we'll say uh, Alexia V, um, and the signal going to the tweeter, if those are perfectly aligned at the listening position, there's going to be a sense of scale and depth that you can't get if it's misaligned. All these things are important. Uh, time alignment is, is the, the highest element on, on our hierarchy of, of importance. Frequency response, I think we've gotten to a day and age 
where uh, with computer modeling and, and current technologies that any loudspeaker worth its weight in salt really can get a relatively flat frequency response. And I'm sure with StereoNet and as you test stuff that you're, you're seeing more and more, it's like, okay, we run the sweep and it, yeah, it's pretty flat, right? But does, does that directly translate to engagement? I think it's important. You never want something where a tweeter is 10 dB you know, hotter than a mid-range. You're going to hear that. Yes. So I think that almost everyone can get relatively flat. And so um, damping of enclosures uh, is important. But if, if you have uh, a, a tweeter where you're hearing the information, um, you know, 50 microseconds, 100 microseconds before the mid-range, your mind translates that to synthetic, that it's not real, that there's a that you're sensing something's disjointed and unnatural. Mm -hmm. It still sounds like a violin, still sounds like a bass, right? But it doesn't sound like it's really there. When you get the time alignment right, it's incredible how the recordings just blossom and open up. And when you close your eyes, you can point to the, the performer's mouth, you know exactly the instrument they're playing and the, and the hall, and, and you're listening to a, a, an acoustic performance and, and it's just them, and then all of a sudden it's a live performance and everyone starts clapping and, and you hear it all around you. That's when all the time alignment is, is as precise as possible, that it fools your mind to, to translating what's being represent, or replayed to you on that recording in a very unique and satisfying way. Yeah. How important is it for Wilson Audio to customize and create your own hardware, drivers or capacitors? And then how does that impact your product development? Yeah, we do wind and create in-house our capacitors. Mm -hmm. Our crossovers are all built in-house with point-to-point -point connections, not using any uh, circuit board, printed circuit boards. We found it on the loudspeaker side, when you use a printed circuit board, that it's dynamically compressing to the sound. For electronics, it's a different thing. That's before it's amplified, right? Mm -hmm. After it's amplified, we found that using you know thicker gauge wire, point to point connection is the is the most authentic way. Uh, we build our own enclosures in house, right? All the enclosures are machined and then hand finished, hand built, hand assembled, hand uh, gel coated, hand painted, hand polished. Um, so all those things are made in house. Uh, our metal, we work with three uh, machine shops locally, and uh, so we support local business and we work very closely with them. One of them we've worked with for uh, 25, 27 years, uh, so we have very deep relationships with them. They understand our quality, they're able to produce the best of the best. So Wilson Audio is really renowned for its modular time aligned loudspeakers that we've spoken about. So there's a lot of faith put into your selected dealers to showcase and install these very specialized products into customers' homes. Can you provide an insight to us about how you train the selected dealers and how they learn to optimize your speaker's performance? Yeah, it, it's a part of the purchase price of every Wilson Audio product that when you buy something is as high-end as a Wilson Audio loudspeaker that the dealer delivers it, make sure that everything in your house is protected as it's being installed, and take the time to install it in the, uh, in the best position in your room for you to get maximum performance out of the system. Some people will say, well, that's, that's overboard. You don't need to do that. I can install it myself. And frankly, if you take two speakers and one is three feet in front of the other, one can't effectively argue that that's the same as someone who comes in and who's trained at hearing a room, listening to a room, and setting up a system in a way that all the lines at the listening position, there's value in that. And so all of our dealers are trained with that. Uh, to become a Wilson Audio authorized dealer, you have to come to Wilson Audio, and we have a training program where they go through a three-day curriculum and, and training them, and, and the art of setting up a system. The WASP, Wilson Audio Setup Procedure, is a part of that. Um, so everyone that buys a Wilson Audio product can rest assured that um, the technicians, the dealer that comes in and sets them up have been trained, um, are familiar with the process. And, and if there are any questions, we, uh, we get questions all the time. Hey, this listening position is slightly outside of the nomograph. And our engineers will actually go in and pull up the model. And based off of the information that, from the test results that I gave them, they can say, okay, they've 
put in the parameters, listening distance, ear height, and give customized settings for that particular room. Um, so there's support from Wilson Audio with a uh, professional and well-trained uh, dealer network. Because yeah. I assume every, every person's house is slightly different. So yep. that professionalism and training is, is really uh, valuable for the end customer. Yeah, and, and that's an important point. Every room is different. Every listening position is different. Every, every per, it, there are an infinite number of possibilities there. So buying a loudspeaker that can't adapt to all those unique positions, mm. there's a slight disadvantage to that. Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna get horrible sound, but I think it's the difference when you have precision found in Wilson Audio products in a standard definition TV, and then you go to a 4K, you're like, you know, I, I know that there was a mountain on the, on that video right there, but with this four, I can see the trees on the top, right? So it, if a person cares about music like that, like some people can stare at a piece of art and they can weep, right? They're so emotionally connected to it. There are some of us in the world that are connected to music like that, and that matters to them. Yeah. So. Wilson Audio has obviously you know, very cutting edge design. Technology's performance is at the forefront. Do you think that Wilson Audio's loudspeakers have also helped or assisted the quality standards of other audio manufacturers across the industry, say amplifier designers or DAC products? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. That there's a symbi uh, symbiotic relationship in the industry that when uh, an amplifier manufacturer uh, increases the performance of their gear, and we use that gear. It helps us with developing and hearing deeper into the music, so it allows us to make better products and then cables and CDs, and it kind of goes round and round. Uh, there are a lot of manufacturers in the industry that use Wilson Audio products as their test gear. Just like with Wilson Audio, we use a variety of, of amplification and CD players and turntables and cables to uh, evaluate and to make our decisions. Um, so I would say yes on that. Good. So there's a Wilson Audio certified authentic program. Can you tell us a little bit more how that came about and how it was received by upcoming and existing customers? Yes, yeah, I, I love Certified Authentic. I've, I've bought a few things in my life. I think all of us have bought a car or you know something like that. How would we feel if we bought that car and then two years later we thought, hey, there's this new model out and this is something I really enjoy. I want to spend my money on this thing. And uh, we bring our car back to the dealer and they say, uh, it has no value. To me, immediately, it's like, I wasted my money, right? I'll, I'll enjoy this thing, but man, I, it, it's almost like a punch to the gut. We believe every Wilson Audio product has value, and it continues to have value. And I would even take products that are 10, 15 years old that are legacy products of Wilson Audio and put them up against equivalently priced products of current models, current day models. So yes, they absolutely have value, and our dealers know that. And people that want to want to experience Wilson Audio products in their home, they are looking for value. Um, a certified authentic Wilson Audio product is the best way to experience Wilson Audio and to get in at, um, at the best price. And so we created a program where if you have a Wilson Audio product, we have uh, values for all of our products. And so a dealer can quickly call us up if they have any questions. We, as Wilson Audio, if the dealer doesn't feel like they can resell that, we will buy it back. Because we know with our dealer network that there is someone out there that would love to own a Sophia Series 2 or a Watt Puppy 7 or you know a Duet Series 1. Yeah. These are still amazing, great products. And we service all of our products that we've ever made. It, it only makes sense. We create a program to where a customer can say, I want to upgrade and I have a Wilson Audio product. Let's make that easy for you. And, and we want to acknowledge that you still have value in, in your product. Mm. Wilson Audio products hold their value uh, longer and stronger than just about any other loudspeaker um, uh, products out there. Um, and I think that it, in large part, it is because of the Certified Authentic Program. Yeah. You've mentioned earlier in the interview around uh, your father, David, who created the company, passing in 2018. Must have been challenging for yourself and for Wilson Audio. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and were you personally reticent to take on the task of leading Wilson Audio 
and how much help and support did you get? I received an incredible amount of support. When, uh, when my father passed, the outpouring of concern and of love and people, people stepping up that know me, that know the team at Wilson Audio, that have seen how we work together and they saw the mentor apprenticeship that my father and I had, there's a lot of trust there. And so I, I feel incredibly blessed. And during the most impossible time of my life, I felt like there was an outpouring of love. Yeah, it, it's still a challenging topic for me to talk about. And I never want it to be easy. I, I love my dad deeply, I miss him dearly. And um, I know he'd be proud of what we're doing. I know that he'd be proud of the team that we have now because everyone's going through struggles. Everyone's going through the, you know, the day-to-day -day life. And day in and day out, this team comes together and we problem solve together, we create excellence together, and we bring the best to the table. And that's hard to find. It really is hard to find. I, I love hearing people's stories of I first met your dad when, and then they fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. I love hearing those stories still. And there are a lot of people that come up and say, I wish I knew your father. Um, that says a lot about his integrity and the way he lived his life. I hope that I'll be remembered like him. Yeah. So um, on a personal level, what's your earliest memory of hi-fi sound? Mm -hmm. And is there a particular moment or turning point where you came to appreciate what you dad had originated and built with Wilson Audio, and then perhaps realizing that significance. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, two things come to mind. The first is um, there's a picture of, of me in my diaper sitting in a listening chair with some prototype whams, right? And then there's another picture of me upside down in the chair being a kid, right? My mom snapped the picture and, and she always says, well, this is Daryl's creative way of uh, reversing the polarity, right? <laughs> uh, so um, sitting next to my dad, uh, not knowing exactly what he's doing. I've been surrounded by music and, you know, hot Krell amplifiers and, and, and strange turntables and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and growing up, I always knew that's dad's system. He taught me to be very careful around things, but music was always a part of my life. And, uh, and so I, I, I loved sitting down next to him and he'd have his eyes closed. And so I'd look, you know, I closed my eyes because he was closing his eyes and I didn't know he was really listening deeply. I just, you know, maybe he's feeling the music, but it was just me and my dad spending time together. Mm -hmm. um, that was, um, that, that's my first, you know, impression of, of music was just, you know, spending time with my dad. I think my kids will share the same story when, uh, my wife will call me on my phone if she's in the bedroom and it's two in, in the morning. Daryl, can you turn it down? The girls are trying to sleep. <laughs> As a kid, I experienced it. I would be up in my room and I'd hear my dad playing, you know, something downstairs and being very generous with the game. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, a, another memory of when I was a kid, my dad, like I mentioned, my dad taught me, you know, be careful with the system and and, and we'd have people coming in and out of the house, dealers, reviewers. I didn't know who they were at the time. It was just, you know, respect that time, go out and play kind of thing. And uh, so I knew how delicate the system was and, you know, don't touch the turntable. And the cats got to sit on the amplifiers to warm up, but my dad, <laughs> they loved it warm. Yeah. Uh, and my dad would have to always, you know, spray out and, you know, get the cat hair out of the krells. But there, there was one time they went out of town and we had a babysitter over and, um, and she was vacuuming by the wham and the vacuum hit the corner of the wham and it chipped off a piece of the wham. And as a kid, you know, you don't know any better, right? Mm. And I'm thinking, my dad's gonna kill her. <laughs> you know, as a kid would think, yeah. right? And he was a perfect gentleman about it and, and not a big deal. They had it fixed and whatnot. But um, yeah, the, the way that I experienced a sound system um, living in the Wilson home um, is, I recognize, absolutely unique. Met a lot of, a lot of people coming in and out of the house. Uh, got to hear a lot of great music. I got to see my dad 
engage with his passion and his hobby on a daily basis and get really excited about things. And there are other days, um, there's a lot of table talk, a lot of talk around you know, the, the dinner table of things they were concerned with that I was privy to because we were all eating dinner. Yeah. Right? That was just the life that I grew up in and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Mm. There's a period of time where Wilson Audio was known for spending whatever it takes to make the best product. Um, do you still take that approach now uh, to new designs? And are you able to look at uh, either more structured or calculated approach to introduce something into a product or a product into the market today? Oh yeah, there. You look at any of our designs, and you can say, "Well, does it really need this? Does it need that?" And and you know, you can go back and forth, and and um, a person could nitpick a, a system, and yeah, I guess we could have a a less expensive you know finish. Some people would care about that. Some people wouldn't. You could do other various things, but it, 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 I don't like the idea of cheapening the product. I personally think that they're uh, works of sonic art and industrial art. Um, and being an artist myself, I like to create things that are beautiful. I like it when the lines on the enclosures organically blend together and meet together we could do things less expensive and not have that, but to me, that's a part of the art. That's a, that's a part of the beauty of it. And, and in fact, these speakers do have to be in a person's room and people do have to see them when the music's not playing. You know, as audio files, we close our eyes when we listen to music, but you do have to see them. And for us who are married, you know, we have to have something that our wives will like. And so having a variety of colors and, and grill options and hardware colors that that you can choose from, I think, uh, really help with that. Yes, we could make decisions to make it less expensive. I won't make decisions that will cheapen the product based off of um, someone else not thinking it's beautiful. If I think it's beautiful, then I want to create the art that I want to create. And then sonic performance. I, I won't compromise on sonic performance. If a, like with V, V material, um, if V material sounds better here, V material goes there. Uh, v material is uh, 25 times more expensive than the standard material used in loudspeakers um, in, in our market. It's more expensive, yet it sounds better. Yeah. It performs better. We will use it. Mm -hmm. So our, our paradigm for making decisions is really based on sonic art and industrial art. How do you make it sound the absolute best? meaning most faithful and uh, the truest fidelity to the recording. And then do I want to see that in my room? And so, you know, the looks are inspired by that. Mm. Do you think that the voicing of the Daryl Wilson era, Wilson audio loudspeakers has changed in any way relative to what uh, your father's products were? And if so, how did that come about? Once again, our, our North star is live, but unamplified music. My father really focused on um, dynamic contrast and harmonic expression as, as two elements that he really needed and wanted the system to recreate, to get as close to that live unamplified music. I think through the decades that as we were pursuing that, that we got to a point to where there was so much refinement that we were able to, what I've affectionately added on to that list is the number three thing, is the micro detail. So dynamic contrast, harmonic expression, and now designs with materials, with the technologies we're uh, using, we're able to really listen so deep in the music that the micro details matter. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that as far as uh, if there is a difference, that it's, it's the way that I listen to music and I was trained by my dad and we listened to countless hours of, of music and uh, live performances together. So I know how he listens to things. And uh, for me, it's, it's listening in uh, deeper beyond just the dynamic contrast and harmonic expression. Those, those micro details, the subtleties of, of how the, the hall sounds, um, you know, the, the nuances around the instrument, the, the, 
ictal sounds of the voice or the breath and how the breath comes out of the artist, those little details, we wouldn't be able to, to hear that and refine the system to reproduce that if we didn't have the first two in spades. And so that I'd say that the best way of answering that is that we refined the system so much using those two parameters to get to our North Star that we did get to a point where it's like, okay, we there there's more we can do now. Yeah. And that leads to an interesting next question around what's the biggest change or evolution you've seen in loudspeakers for the last decade and what do you projecting that may be changes coming up in the next 10 years? Mm, the crystal ball question. Yeah. Right. Um, man, if, if I had a really well honed crystal ball, I'd, I'd be making a lot of money. I, I would have bet on Bitcoin a long time ago. Loudspeakers. So generally speaking in the market, what are loudspeakers doing now? I think that um, the industry in general and as a whole is better off that loudspeaker manufacturers are spending more time and resources making better cabinets. Better material research, I think, is uh, benefiting the, the entire industry. I, all, all loudspeaker manufacturers that participate in that and actively engage that are, are doing exceptionally well. Now, they may be asking different questions than we ask and maybe have different answers than what we have. I still respect it. You know, what Rockport's doing is uh, incredibly fascinating. And um, I respect a lot their process and what they do to create their enclosures. They're asking slightly different questions and, they're, and, and they go down a different road than what we do and prioritize things a little different than we do. And that's okay, right? That's, that's their art. Our art is focused on different things. And I think that we can have and we should have respect for, you know, for different um, designers and artists that, that bring their best to the table and they're willing to dedicate their time and energy and their lives to answering the questions they feel are most important to them. What I don't have a lot of respect for is uh, companies that come into our industry that say, hey, these, these other companies are, are selling X, Y, and Z for these amounts. We can create a product as cheap as possible and put it into the same category because, hey, the, the consumer won't know the difference. And that creates confusion. And then you have bad experiences with those type of, of systems. And then all of a sudden, a broad you know, stroke is cast across the whole industry mm. as in, well, all companies are doing this. And not all companies are doing this. Uh, you know, walking through Wilson Audio and seeing how things are are handcrafted and the attention to detail that goes into all this stuff versus someone that just offshores something, gets an enclosure, stuffs a couple things in it, and slaps a label on it, saying that it's made in the country, that it was assembled in, not really made in. That's I, th I think, a little dishonest. Mm. That's not Wilson Audio. We will always do uh, things the way we do um, to. Once again, the level of authenticity and striving for excellence. Um, and the people that know us, they know that's the way that we uh, operate. Um, and the people that don't know us, I hope that they find us on, on our website, on Facebook, on all the social medias. I hope they do the research. I hope they watch our YouTube channel and, and really get to know us. We've got a great uh, Wilson Way book. It's the, the first 50 years. Are the, well, it was, it was right after my dad passed. It's the first uh, you know, 47 years of Wilson Audio. There's great history in there. And, and if people uh, want to understand and know Wilson Audio, we've provided lots of resources. Moving forward, the next decade? What? The crystal ball, yeah, yes. Where, where, where's the crystal ball? What's it showing? Yeah, so, so to take that thought and, and say what I'm seeing in the industry and areas that I really respect and areas that um, uh, I think may be harming the industry. I think in the future there's going to be uh, more companies that see this industry as um, as a potential place to make money and take advantage of people. I hope that there's less of that. I think that we're surrounded by people that care enough about this industry and and authenticity that there are enough brands that are have really brought exceptional products to the market where it will it'll push out these other you know companies that are i guess pretending so to speak but yeah. trying to trying to profit off of it i think that there's going to be 
more advancements in material research and uh, application, specific application of those materials. I think that uh, driver technology is going to continue to be explored. To Some of them will be fruitful. I think some won't be fruitful. But that's the nature of it. And I think that's the way it's been for, you know, as long as the industry has been around. And I think the biggest area is going to be materials. Okay. And that, so f final question is, um, mentioned that Wilson Audio is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. What do you think high-end audio will look like in another 50 years? And what role do you hope that Wilson Audio plays in that? Uh, does Elon Musk get his way? That's the, <laughs> the part of the question that's important, right? Because if that's a part of the question, then we all have neural links at that point. We're all streaming music directly to our brain and we're experiencing this augmented reality and, and who knows, it might be apocalyptic, <laughs> I don't know, 50 years from now. Um, uh, we'll be listening to great systems on Mars. How about that? Okay. I, yeah, I, don't, I, I hope that I hope that, that companies that have a group of people that love what they do continue to refine their craft and continue to make great products, no matter if it's electronics or loudspeakers or cables or whatever, that companies continue to do that. And we, as people who are passionate about experiencing music at the highest level, continue to be rewarded by seeing advancements in all areas. Yeah. So on behalf of StereoNet, thank you very much, Daryl, for your time today and sharing your wonderful insights into Wilson Audio uh, and with everyone. It's really been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah.